Hello, my name is No Jin Kwak. I'm the director of NAM Center for Korean Studies. Welcome everybody to the uh, colloquium lecture this afternoon. We learn about um, what I say very exciting collaboration between historian and sociologist this afternoon about the intergenerational mobility in late Joseon uh, period. Uh, this program of research is a very interesting attempt to statistically analyze historical archive, uh, census data collected every three years in Joseon uh, period. Um, I'm in Kam studies, and there is a theory called Spiral of Silence, which was introduced in 1970s. And there was a paper several years ago that tried to use that theory to statistically analyze data collected in 1920s. So we found that was a really interesting attempt, try to use modern statistics and theory to understand what was more or less historical data. But this research will go all the way down to 19th century, so it's even further. So it'll be very interesting. So we have, um, uh, uh, I guess we have only one speaker, but this research has been done by two uh, professors, um, Professor Hyunjun Park, uh, who is Korea Foundation uh, Associate Professor of Sociology and Education at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, Professor Park is interested in social stratification, education, and family in comparative and historical perspectives, uh, focusing on Korea and other Asian countries. Uh, Professor Kwak is the, uh, Park is the author Kwak, of Re-Evaluating uh, Education in Japan and Korea, Demystifying uh, Stereotypes. Uh, Professor Kun Tae Kim uh, from Seoul National University is teaching in the Department of Korean Studies. And Professor Kim's research focuses on agriculture and historical uh, demography of Joseon Dynasty. He published many, many papers, uh, including uh, family succession through adoption in the Joseon Dynasty, and also tracking individuals and households, longitudinal features of uh, Dansong household register data. Please uh, join me welcoming Professor Park and Kim. But can I move around though? I mean, I'm more like a mobile person, Feel but free. okay. But I just wanted to make sure that it's not rec. I mean, okay. So thanks for coming to the, today. I'm going to talk about the issue about the intergenerational mobility across many generations. But this is joint work between the sociologists and historians. So in addition to I hope that you know, the, in addition to make you interest in this particular study, but I hope that we can also demonstrate that you know the collaboration between sociologists and historians can produce interesting work to you know the Korean studies fields or even beyond that. So let me start with the the general motivation for this research. So because I'm a sociologist, let me start with the sociological research motivation. Then, you know, Kunte will answer all the difficult questions, especially relate to historical materials. So bear in mind that I'm not a historian, so you're not supposed to ask about the question about the historical materials. So he will answer to those, you know, the interesting questions. But I will try, because I'm learning history myself, so I have a, my learning curve is actually increased now, so I think I can answer to some of those, you know, the question about the history as well as sociology. So in sociology, there is, you know, one of the core question in sociology, and I think even, you know, probably in broad, in other field of social science, is about the intergenerational transmission of advantage and disadvantage across generation. So typically in this, you know, the perspective, people, scholars looking at how parent socioeconomic position affect, you know, the adult children, in the socioeconomic position. In other words, how your parents' economic, cultural, and social resource affect your chance of going to college, getting good jobs, or even getting married, or probably less, even likely to divorce. So you know, the people, especially in sociologists, people try to understand how parents' background, usually the, we call the social origins, how social origins affect your destination. But as you can clearly see that this perspective, be relationship between parents and children's are the two generational perspective. And much of, of the researchers in this field actually assume the nuclear based actually family, a uh, nuclear family as a kind of you know the base assumption here. So in other words, parents affect children's social outcome 
either education again or occupations or even marriage, divorce, your health, all other things you know that actually matter for your social life. So people again, I mean, very much looking at this relationship between parents and actually children. So this is a typically two generation model again. But nowadays there's a growing interest. I mean, people are going that. So let me show some one famous you know the figure in sociology. So this is the kind of conceptualization of how sociology see you know the stratification operate. So as you can see, this is a very famous past analysis model from Blau and Duncan in many old, you know, many years ago. As you can see, the sociologists, you know, the conceptualize the social origin as measured by the father's education and father's occupation. So these two things, which again indicate the social origin, and social origins affect through different channels. Again, the through the education or first job will eventually affect your current job in 1962. So this is a study in the old days of 1962 occupation was the final destination. As you can clearly see in these figures, again, the main interest so that sociologists have is about the relationship between parents, which are indicated by father's occupation, father's education, and the children's destination and occupation in 1961. Right? So this is very typical, again, I think, you know, the relationship that sociologists are interested about. You may wonder by now why only fathers, you know, the you know, occupation and, you know, father's education, but not why the mother's education, mother's occupation, right? So this is a now, actually, we sociologists bring to more to this, you know, social origin aspect, in expand the social origin, but in 1960, pretty much, in, you know, focus on this father's characteristic. But the point here is that, you know, the sociologists basically interest about this relationship between parents and children. You know, how your parents' education affect your chance again coming to the Michigan, right? As compared to other you know, other school, how your your father's, you know, or mother's social capital, cultural capital affect your chance of getting good jobs as compared to other, you know, the not good jobs. So those are the kind of main questions that sociologists had for a long time. But nowadays there's a growing interest though, I mean, in probably beyond the two generations. So for instance, what about the grandparents, right? I mean, you can imagine that, you know, because nowadays, you know, because of the aging, more and more children actually have more time compared to the past to interact with their grandparents. So my grandparents die even I become age seven. So I didn't have much chance to interact with grandparents. So probably grandparents will not that matter for me, I mean, at least in terms of interaction, because they never tell me that you study hard, so that you, you know, the, that's how you can succeed. But my grandparents now can talk to my daughters that, hey, you gotta work hard, otherwise look at your dad. <laughs> so there is much more chance now actually grandchildren to interact with grandparents. So that means there's even beyond two generations, grandparents may matter for your life course outcome. And another reason why we become more interested about the, you know, the grandparents is about the in increasing income inequality. Nowadays in the United States, there is a growing income inequality. Now top 1%, 5%, 10% on more than, you know, obviously many other, you know, the, the below the people, but this concentration of income to the, four, you know, 1%, 5%, and 10%, 10% has increased over time dramatically in the United States. So that actually raised lots of concern about the social mobility. And you know, because of this intense, intensified competition for social mobility, maybe parents want to draw you know, many other resources available from parents, grandparents, maybe even relatives. You know, to support your education for college, they may want to draw actually from many other sources beyond, the gender, you know, beyond uh, parents. So there's a possibility that now we may see increasing actually importance of grandparents' characteristic for grandchildren's actually characteristic social economic outcome. In fact, in Korea, there's a very interesting joke which may reflect that there's some of you know, the realities, that changing reality in South Korea. Uh, there are three conditions to be met for educational success for child, okay? So this is joke, don't be serious. I mean, this is just joke. <laughs> And you have to think about in Korea, the mothers are the major players for children's education and success. So they spend so much time in every day to talk about 
you know, to find out, you know, the, about the cram school, private tutoring. So if you go to like, you know, the daytime, go to coffee shops around the, this, you know, good school district, you see lots of mothers that are gathered every single day actually to talk about all this kind of, you know, the information about education. So mothers are key players in Korean context. So there's a two jokes that three conditions that need to be met for children's education success. One is actually mother's information, gathering power and energy. So mother have to know, and mothers actually have to spend so much time to figure out what's the best for their kid. But fathers, just bring money, that's your job. <laughs> so fathers' lack of interest and concern for children's education. Fathers will mess up the children's education, so they should not be concerned, okay? Just leave the job to mothers, but just bring the money. But what is the third condition to be met? That's a grand father's wealth. Okay, this is a joke, obviously, <laughs> but, but I think it tells something about the changing realities. So now even in Korea, with this, you know, the very high, you know, competition for educational success, parents should try to withdraw, you know, to draw so much, you know, the resource from many other possibility beyond their own resource. So grandparent resource become matter more, probably relatives, or even some other you know, resource become matter more for children's education. So this is where you know, sociologists become more interested about the stratification process beyond the two generations. So let's bring the grandparents to the picture and see how we can understand, better understand this deep structure of inequalities that is prevalent in, in, in contemporary societies. So people, again, I think the point is that in the past, we were basically much interested about this relationship, but now people start to become more interested about this relationship, right? But there's a two different views in sociology and in social science about the role of the grandparents. The first argument is that, yes, grandparents may matter for grandchildren, but only through parents. In other words, grandparents may affect, may increase the parents' chance for being educational success, but that's it, because, I mean, then their effect on grandchildren, but not direct effect of grandparents' to children, okay? So this is very important to think about. They are not arguing that grandparents do, uh, do not matter, but they argue that grandparents matter, but only through the parents. So there's no direct effect of grandparents to the children. All we do, educate parents, then parents will educate the kids. The grandparents, if they matter, it will matter through the parenting, okay? So again, but the other, actually, you know, the perspective in these fields argue that no, there might be, there might be some direct effect even after taking into account this pay. Okay, so what could be possible mechanism that these grandparents still matter for grandchildren directly? So if you think about one example in this country is actually the legacy system of college admission. So if your grandparents came to Ivy League school, you have had a chance to get into the, you know, the Ivy League school then compared to those who don't have father, uh, grandparents who actually graduate from Ivy League school, right? Although nowadays, we don't know yet, uh, we don't know for sure how much actually this legacy system works, but in the past, obviously this leg legacy system of college admission worked in this country. So it is a new idea, in fact, that grandparents may matter even directly for grandchildren's success. Not only through the parents, but through, you know, directly to grandchildren. I don't know whether you actually look at, uh, you know, the newspaper, but in 2009, actually, some of public school district, two school districts in LA area, this is a public high school, not even college, they also adopted this, uh, you know, the legacy system. So they actually give priority to children whose grandfather lived in that area. You know, into a, in a uh, two public school district in the LA area. So there is, is actually you know the example of this direct effect of grandparents. Also, if you think about this, lots of grandmothers now in Korea take care of their actual grandchildren while their daughters and son-in-laws actually working during the day. So there are I, I, again, I think that reflect this aging effect, right? So the people more and more live longer, so then they actually can take care of their grandchildren, so they can interact with their grandchildren directly as compared to the old days where my grandparents actually couldn't survive actually, you know, longer than, you know, than now, okay? 
this multi-generational view of inequality actually, you know, the point out the legacy effect of grandparents or even ancestor. And if indeed this, you know, the social strat uh, stratification process is multi-generational, it suggests the different structure of inequality than suggested by the two-generation model. So two-generation model somehow assume that this process will actually re Re, uh, become re, uh, it will be renewals for every genera every two generation. But this multi-generational view of inequality see that the deeper structures of influence of lag, you know, the lagged effect of grandparents. But maybe though this grandparents effect may operate more on the top and lower bound, uh, the uh, at the top and bottom, you know, the at, uh, of the social economy hierarchy rather than middle. Because at the middle, probably people may actually move around, actually, you know, to achieve and uh, down mobility. But probably at the very highs, like in an elite family, they may continue this, you know, the legacy effect of their grandparents or ancestor for a long time or a slavery system. Again, this, you know, the grandparents' effect may not affect, may not operate all, you know, similarly across all, you know, socioeconomic in a position, but particularly, you know, probably more in the top and bottom of socioeconomic uh, hierarchy, because that's where probably, for instance, uh, wealth, wealth may be actually preserved from across many generations among this elite family. Slavery, because of this inheritance of slavery, you know, the status may be actually, you know, the gen you know, the pre preserved actually across many generations. So, in fact, Ron Mayers in uh, his papers, he argued that he point out this possibility that if we don't see the effect of direct effect of grandparents among the middle of the you know the population, but we may see at the top and bottom that you know grandparents may or ancestor even may still matter directly for their grandchildren's you know the educational success and occupational success. Since then, there has been actually you know, the dramatic increase of you know, the papers on these issues in sociology. So I bring up just sociology because it shows that how you know, the people you know, study diverse, you know, in diverse contexts. So actually an old paper, relative old paper, 1997, they look at the Wisconsin, just one sample with the Wisconsin, and they found actually no direct effect of grandparents in the United States. So they found that yes, grandparents matter for grandchildren's education and occupation, but once they take into account father's and mother's occupation and education, the direct effect disappear. So in other words, all the effect of grandparents on grandchildren go through the parents in Wisconsin, in 19, you know, using the, the uh, using the Wisconsin data. But since then, actually, you know, the study look at in Britons, look at the three grandparents' effect in social mobility three generations, and actually Zheng and Xi, Yu Xie, who is in sociology here, they look at the rural China, and they found that, in, interesting enough, the grandparents matter for grandchildren's education only if they live together. So that's kind of interesting, you know, the idea that, okay, if the grandparents matter, how do they matter? Probably by interacting together. So, you know, the living together may increase you know, the impact of grandparents on the grandchildren's education. Then I, with the, my students, actually, we look at this multi-generational perspective on educational attainment in Taiwan as well. And we also found the f effect of grandparents' education on grandchildren, but for certain, only certain group of students rather than all of the students. So I think there's a, lots of study now try to understand the context upon which basically this you know, the grandparents become matter for grandchildren's, you know, the education and occupational success, okay? By the way, I'm welcome to questions. So if you, you know, f feel free to ask, you know, then we'll try to, you know, answer the question quickly. But if it's a question that I need a long, you know, the longer time, then I will actually come back to after, you know, the, my talk. So, so feel free to stop me, you know, the, during the talk. So. There's a lot of now actually growing, you know, again, I think in, especially in sociology, you know, the community to look at this effect of grandparents, you know, and this research actually expand this previous research on social stratification so that, you know, we now get a uh, getting better idea about how, you know, the stratification may operate even beyond the two generations, okay? So let me just summarize quickly about what we know about the grandparents' effect in this field, okay? 
So there's, though, I mean, you know, the, again, I, uh, as I just mentioned about two different perspectives, there is this agreement on the effect of grandparents, net of parents. Some show positive effect, but others shows no remaining effect after contouring for parents. So before contouring for parents, you see that grandparents actually, you know, the grandparents' socioeconomic status are associated with the grandchildren's, you know, the uh, socioeconomic position. But once we take into account the parents' socioeconomic position, usually the relationship disappear because most of the effect of grandparents come indirectly through the parents. Okay. But again, some people argue that now in this different change context, we may see the direct effect of even direct effect of grandparents. So we now actually have growing knowledge on how context condition the effect of grandparents, such as you know the living together may matter, or some country may matter more than other country because you know di different living arrangement, different culture. So we actually getting there to know more about you know why and why not this there is direct effect of grandparents. Then there's uh, some interesting you know the kind of question to be asked in this literature about effect of grandparents. What about grandmother versus grandfather? Do grandmothers matter more than grandfathers or vice versa? Or maybe they're the same? What about the paternal grandparents versus maternal grandparents? Is that the grand, uh, maternal grandmothers, paternal grandmothers? I think you know, the maternal grandmother may matter more for me than like the paternal grandmothers. I didn't like that much about the paternal grandmothers, which is very typical, right, in Korea, I guess. So, but I mean, that's a kind of interesting idea, interesting question about you know the what matters more, who matters more. But again, another interesting question that we actually will take up in this particular paper is a differential effect at the top, middle, and bottom of social hierarchy. So, at the very bottom of the hierarchies, do how you know, to what extent this disadvantage of being at the bottom of the social economic hierarchy continue ever across the generation? So those are the kind of questions that we want to take up in this particular paper. But later, we are working on another paper, and we will be looking at the effect of mothers as well. But in this particular paper, we will not consider mother that much in you know, for some reason. But there are challenges to multi-generational research. Obviously, the most probably relevant limitation is about the data, right? Facility uh, of multi-generational research is partially due to the lack of data across generation. Like in the United States, people start to use, you know, the PSID, which is, you know, actually Michigan actually start in you know, that survey, and they start to actually have more than three generations by now. But you have to wait until long times, right? Until to get these three generation, you know, the information. So people, in fact, you know, the start to use many uh, different data set across many different country and growing number of studies on three generations. We now actually start to see, but rare for more than three generation. Obviously, you have to have data for more than three generations. That's a pre actually, in, you know, the rares across many, you know, the country and many time periods and contexts. And more importantly, from our perspective, relatively little, little research has addressed how long this advantage of those at the uh, bottom of social hierarchy had been carried over to their descendants beyond your grandchildren. So there's a study by, done by Cameron Campbells and James Lee, who was actually in Michigan many years ago. They look at this, you know, elite, you know, the uh, groups in China using the genealogy, but that's an elite group. But we don't know much about really, you know, the people at the bottom of the socioeconomic hierarchy, especially slavery, slave. So that's where we, you know, the kind of bring the, our data and our insight to address the issue about how being at the bottom of the social economic you know hierarchies affects your chance but also your uh, grandsons and even you know the great grandsons you know the actually you know the sons uh, uh, occupational mobility over the generation so our studies we actually look at the legacy of the nobi system in Joseon from late 18th to 19th century. So I will explain a little bit about what the Nobis and cho what the Joseon is actually. So hold your question a little bit if you're not familiar with the Nobi system. Okay, so I will actually explain a little bit. But the basically Nobi, okay, there's a debate whether Nobis really can be translated slaves. 
whether they're the same as you know, no, in the, especially in American slavery system. So I will not get into that, you know, the debate because there's a whole lot. I think it's a different, you know, the question. But let's assume for the time being. Don't quote me yet, but let's assume that nobody's a slave that they, for the time being for our purpose because that doesn't matter for my our papers. Okay. So here's nobody's are slaves. Okay. So Nobis uh, systems, uh, chosen from 18th to 19th century, and we ask how it was difficult for descendant of slave ancestor to obtain a world social mobility to the high states as compared to descendant from other higher status group, even after abolition of the Nobis system, okay? But again, did they have disadvantage because of their you know, the great grandfather or because their fathers and their grandfather didn't make it, right? So the question is even after controlling for fathers and grand, grand even grandfather social status, do we see the significant disadvantage of this Nobi, you know, the descendant of Nobi ancestor as compared to descendant of a higher status, you know, the ancestor? So those are the kind of questions that we want to address in this particular paper, okay? Okay, six second lectures for so, in the chosen history. So, chosen began in 1392, and it actually lasts in 1910. So it's about more than 500 years. So it's a pretty long, actually, years of governance. I mean, if governing, if you think about this way, five year, 500 years, it's not actually, you know, the short, you know, the time. And five, that's where our data began. And 1801, abolition of government owned the uh, slaves. So Joseon had a two different kinds of nobis, which is slaves. One is actually government owned the nobi, but the other the other group is actually private owned nobi. So if you think about the slave, that's your idea is a pretty close to this private owned nobi. But this government owned nobis are a little different. In, although they are the nobi, but in terms of the life condition, in terms of you know, because they all belong to actually government rather than actually private owners. So they're not the private owners, you know, the actually, they don't belong to actually private owners, but they are working for the government office and, you know, that their local government office. So those are the uh, government owned the NOBI, and the system was abolished in 1801. The entire NOBI system was actually abolished in 1894. So this is a time period that we are looking at. So we have the data that um, about this time, after all this abolish, you know, government owned nobi were abolished, then the fact that your ancestor were nobi at this time period, right? So how does that matter for your chance now to get to the high status position? So those are the kind of questions that we want to address. Again, if you have some question about historical Tom, and please feel free to ask the question. So here's a little bit about the social status system in Joseon. So Joseon actually distinguished people into two major categories, the commoners and base people. So nobis are the base people and they are the slaves, and which, you know, I already mentioned that government owned the nobi were abolished in 19, uh, 1801. So those are the kind of people that we are interested about this particular paper, but as you can see, these commoners can be further distinguished into four different groups, depends on their social status. So the highest group of the people in Joseon, they were exempt from military service. So for the commoners were originally subject to the military service. Okay, everyone has to be subject to military service. I'm talking about the men in this particular paper. So women is a different story and different way of classifying their social status. But here's a man, you know, highest group of men were exempt from military service to prepare for their civil service exam. So they were able to take a civil service exam and they could actually go to the, you know, they can get an office, you know, off, they, can, they, they can become an office after, you know, the passing the civil service exam. The second highest group of the people were those who were exam again from military service, but most of them actually prepare for the military exam. So in Chosun, actually, these military uh, officers were the, below this, you know, the, you know, those who passed the civil service exam. So these are the kind of two people, or two group of people who are basically exempt from military service, okay? And these two other groups are the people who were actually, you know, the, had to do, take their role for this military service. 
But when they were called for military service, this third group of people were become the officers. But this last group of people in, among commoners were the rank and file soldiers. So they are not soldiers in everyday life. Only when they're called upon for the military service, they're distinguished from different, you know, the actual status. But obviously, this comes from the everyday life because you are the officers and I'm the rank, you know, in everyday life. But that does not necessarily mean that, again, they're the old soldiers, okay? Chosen people's all the soldiers, you know, that's nonsense, right? They are not soldiers in everyday life, but they are probably engaged in agricultural work, they were engaged in some of other things. But when they are called upon for the military service, they are distinguished between you know, two the officers and the rank and so you know the files, you know, the soldiers. Then the nobis, okay? So those these those these five groups of people are the distinguished in terms of their social status. But because of the data uh, constraint, then we actually combine these two highest group as a high group, then these two middle group as a middle and low. So from now on, when I, I say high, high indicate the two groups, middles, two middle groups, and low is actually nobis, the slaves, okay? Is that clear? So did I do a good job to explain this sort of status in chosen? Yeah, this is something that I'm learning, so. But there's a very interesting feature of social status system, which I think is makes really interesting if you are interested about the slavery system. Chosen slavery system, nobis system, is really makes it very interesting. One is they're the, basically the same people in race and ethnicity. So the, no, the social status system didn't intersect with the race and ethnicity in Korea. So it is not certain group of people that are nobis. They are the exactly the same race and ethnic groups, right? Because Korea was actually a homogeneous population at that moment. So it's a pretty the same people. In other words, by looking at just, you know, periods, you can distinguish. Although probably they were different in terms of, you know, the maybe clothes different, you know, depends on whether you have money or not. But, you know, the, by just looking at people, you cannot distinguish basically whether they are nobis and, you know, they're not nobis, right? Or even the commoners among the commoners. And another important feature of the social status system in chosen is sector, very minimal, very limited residence or segregations. So in other words, it was not like a nobi was segregated into certain area as really separate from other you know, commoners. Basically, they just lived in the same village. So within the same village, probably there was some you know, segregation, obviously, but still within you know, the village, they were very mingled together. So that's a very important, I think, the point that when we think about the effect of social status in Joseon, you know, no difference by race and ethnicities and very limited degree of residence segregation. Then how do people actually distinguish themselves? So I think this is kind of interesting questions. And more importantly, there's no formal law about the inheritance of social status except for Nobi. In other words, Yangin can basically, the commoners, in principle, I mean, socially, you see that more people actually stay in their you know, the status, but it, by law, actually these people can move around within this young group. Yes, I'm not saying that socially. Socially, probably there is a tendency that high people will stay as a high status, like the same in this in, in contemporary periods, right? The people with the you know, doctors fa whose fathers are doctor, lawyers, they will probably have a very high chance to stay with a very high status position as well. But by law, they still can have a chance to move up and move down, except as nobi. So that's another, I think, the important point to think about when we consider the effect of social status. In other words, these different feature of social uh, status system in Joseon somehow suggest that maybe this effect of social status of the ancestors may not be strong in, in Joseon, right? Because there's no race and essence intersect with the social status. Residence segregation didn't actually, you know, was not actually quite uh, high, and there was no formal like your law to prevent actually upward and downward social mobility, right? So then actually that suggests us to think, of, uh, you know, to expect probably the effect of ancestors' social status may not m matter that much in this kind of particular situation. But, but on reality though, maybe there's a, some very significant difference across the social status. 
So we don't exactly know how social status is correlated with the wealth measure. For instance, high state status people, do they, do they have like much more money than actually Nobi? To what extent? So we don't have much information about the wealth. Like, so we can't tell. But there's a one interesting uh, story. You know, th this is written in 19th century uh, in Human Geography of Jeju. And this is one story about um, Mr. Cha, who was actually you know, the high status person. But somehow he was very poor. And he was dying, downgraded to the hustler. In other words, this group, I mean, these people who take care of the horse in the Jeju area, where our data actually came from, was belonged to the middle low status. It's one of the lowest you know, the social status among the, young, uh, the commoners, right? Again, if I can go back. So he, he was here probably, I don't know whether he, but he now downgraded to here because he was poor during his lifetime. Again, it shows that, yes, it is possible that these people can even, you know, uh, the down, downward mobility, right? I mean, there was possibility for downward mobility. So he had a daughter, unmarried daughters, being shamed or on her downgrade status and its impact on her marriage chance eventually, she kills herself. So even though these kind of feature of social status uh, system seem to suggest that maybe weak effect of the social status, but in reality, there is a very strong, you know, very substantial differentiation in terms of life chance across among the, and among the di different social status group in Chosun. Again, unfortunately, we don't know exactly how social status was correlated with the wealth and other you know, in, in, important indicator, but this certainly tells us about how social status, status were actually matters in realities in Joseon period. Yes? No, I think that's a very important uh, the question because, but in old days, Unless you pass the exam, right? I mean, you pass the exam, then you know you become the first class, obviously. But besides that, there was no clear uh, information about how they actually got this position. So, in other words, how they become how they become the officers rather than you know rank and soldiers. We don't know much about that mechanism in actual real. I mean, in the historical study, couldn't find information about exactly how they end up with that particular. So. We only know about the outcomes, but we don't know much about the, how they actually end up their particular you know, social status. But the point is that it is not just simply inherited from the you know the parents, uh, the fathers, but it is actually you know there can be you can be mobiles across. Maybe some of them actually accumulate the wealth so that they actually increase you know the, so there's a, some you know the speculation that you know wealth probably matter to increase your social status, but for instance, if that be $100 would be enough to get you the you know, first class or $200. So we don't know much about it. That details about you know what actually makes someone become the first class as you know as compared to third class. Yes. Again, I think it, these people. These people were engaged in some of them, probably agricultural, some of the commercial work, some of the other work. So I think these are the, all the people. So I think this is not based on their occupation. Again, this is a social status measure. So there is probably some correlation with the occupation, but it's not entirely correlated because, again, among the farmers, there are some you know, the officers and there are some rank and file soldiers. We just simply don't have enough information from historical study. Not because of me, but in fact, in historically, it is very limited information about why exactly put someone into the officer position rather than rank and in the file. We think of this is probably social recognition at that police level, so that even though we don't know much about the exact mechanism, but the people at that time period knew that you are the third rank, you are the fourth, you know, but we simply just don't have in much information about how that exactly operate in that chosen period. Right, so that's why we are going to the document. Right, so we know that their occupation, so uh, uh, the final outcome, but we just don't know how they end up with the, 
Although we can probably follow them over the years, so then we can kind of see when you know they become to the third. But again, then we don't have much information about the wells that they accumulate. You know, the, so that's hard to actually distinguish. But yeah, we'll get to the point that where we can get this information. Thank you for a very you know important actual point. So again, this tells us about how this you know the reality was actually you know about the social status. But this social status system changed over time, and especially in the 19th century, there was a dramatic change in the social status system. So at the bottom of the hierarchy, right, again, the, the novice system was abolished in 1801, but also at the top rank, there was a dramatic increase of this top position. So more and more people now in the past than in the past actually are were actually in the top rank position. So in other words, this you know top position was actually become open to many people. So more and more people actually become the first you know the class, in a sense, right? So like if you think about the professional position over the time in this country, in all the time period. Professional position was small, right? Very small of the whole uh, labor force. But because of the tr you know, technological change, educational expansion, this actually pro you know, professional position become enlarged over time. But the point is that whether does that really means that the effect of grandparents actually reduce over time? So that's the kind of question that we want to address. So increase of the time, uh, the position at the top does not necessarily mean the change in the effect of ancestor because that simply means that there's more job at more people at the top but relative chance of going to that particular position may not change over time in fact so that's what we are actually going to show you that you know what happens given these situations where the, at the bottom novice system was abolished at the top there was a more open space more slot at the top then basically more people are forced to move up because there's a more open at the top but who are those who actually enter their first you know the first rank you know the position in this expansion of the you know the first class position so those are the kind of situation that we are dealing with in this paper does that make sense Okay, here's a historical part from here. So maybe you can ask to contest rather than me, but let me try. Uh, so this is the data that we're going to use from the household register. So it's called the Hojog in Korean. And chosen, through the Joseon government, the actual Joseon government uh, compiled this household register in every three years. So Joseon government, I mean, isn't that amazing? The country, you know, in eight, you know, in these old days, they tried to collect the information about the residents in every three years, about their births, about their marriage, about their deaths. So this is a pretty amazing, I think, you know, the operations and in that old days. So this is or, you know, this original you know, joke. And what we did actually, we actually type all the information that in the book into the Excel file, basically. Can you imagine? So <laughs> I, to be honest, I didn't do it. Uh, so, you know, Kunte most, you know, did. But <laughs> we actually all type all this information into Excel file. Then what I did is I just trans, uh, transfer one more time from Excel to the statistical data file that I can use. But, you know, very, from the very beginning, this is amazing record that, you know, we have to work with. So what kind? What is actually household registers itself? So it, household registers are record of heads and number of uh, members of the household. So individuals were grouped into household first of all. So that's why they call the whole. Whole is in a household, which were in turn grouped into the larger unit. But these household register were compiled in every three years. So it's kind of repeat census in every three years. So if you actually link them over the years, you can see when they died basically between three years, right? We don't know much about what happened between three years because, you know, let's say, you know, I married next year, you know, between two years, then they don't record the year of marriage, but they say just marry. So then it means that whatever that time period between three years, the marriage happened. 
So that's how actually they record. But they basically record uh, the purpose of taxation. So this is an important point. So that we have to think about, you know, basically when you, we want to use the household register, we have to very carefully to, you know, to think about uh, what was the purpose of this, you know, record. And that was actually for the tax purpose. Uh, tax purpose. And that's why we can get the information about social status because just tax, you know, the issues. So what kind of information are in, uh, in the household register? So we know the gender, age, and relation to the head of the household, and social status, first and last name, father's name, grandfather's name, great-grandfather's great name, and more interesting enough, name of mother's fathers as well. So in fact, we have information of a four, you know, the, right, the three, you know, fathers, again, grandfather, great-grandfathers, and mother's fathers. So these are the kind of basic information that we uh, use to link individuals across four or five generations. Because we know grand, you know, fathers are in names, and if they were found in all your registers, we can link them with the current, you know, the residents of the people, right? Yes? In terms of social status, you mean one of the uh, actually, it was much detail, but we actually kind of, you know, the group, because this is a uh, indicator of the some kind of, you know, the it's called the chigyok in Korean. Uh, so it is more detail, in fact. So, but we actually kind of group detail like a hustler, right? I mean, like a. Uh, I think I gave the one example. Oh, where is that? Uh, maybe. So this is the one example. Uh, okay. So this is a one example of the fourth, you know, the status in a kind of occupation. I, I, I don't want to say occupation because it's not occupation per se, but this is a kind of indicator to indicate that, you know, this person belong to this fourth social status group. So you say I'm selling shoes or merchandise. No, it's not like that though. I mean, that kind of job is not like we are looking at. We, are, we know that it tells much more clear it's about the social status. So in household register, no, the, we don't see. Because this is uh, kind of one of the job for military service. So we actually can't tell you know, to whether you belong to the fourth you know, or third group. But your question is about the occupation, which is uh, different from this social status indicator. These people who sell the shoes can be linked with the third group, right, fourth group, depends on what kind of, you know, the social status they were uh, assigned to. So then you have to look up their social status indicators, and that tells us whether this pe person belonged to third or fourth group. So is it social status for individual? Yes, it is individual, because it is based on... Exactly. That's why we can think about the mobility. Otherwise, it's all like it's not a caste system. That's, that's what I'm saying. Joseon uh, social system is not like a caste system. So in other words, you can actually move around. You can do, uh, make a board mobility, downward mobility. Although I mean the Nobi was the exception. I mean, but Nobi was ab abolished in 1801, and after that, it was free in principle. Although socially it was free, that's a different question, and we will show you that it was not free at all. But by law, though, I mean, there was no... So my question is more about the, um, not between records, but okay. without giving names. There are three or four people listed. Right. Can one person be classified as belong to half group? Right. Yeah. Right, exactly. Right. Yes, yes. That's why we actually look at this, you know, the difference. Otherwise, you see the, all the same correlation across, the, you know, the generation. But, in fact, there are lots of people move up and even move down. But... This mostly happened within the middle class, middle group. At the very top, you don't see much actual movement because, again, that's what I think. You know, this is about this. As I made a point at the very early, maybe grandparents and ancestry effect may operate at the very top and bottom. But middle of the people can move up or move down. In fact, so this is what we actually we're going to show you in a moment. So. This is a one page from the household register. So if you know a little bit about Chinese characters, okay, I'm afraid to tell you, but so this is you know the whole. So in other words, this is uh, indicate the four families of four household. So these were the no, which is indicate no, no, the slave. So this person name is Yang Yongbaek, is Korean name, and he is basically no, the a slave. 
And he was born in Jeju, which is our data. <laughs> but this is the father, right? The father, and the father was also uh, the, the slave, and his name was Hyun. So we know father's name, father's status. If you look at here, is the grandfathers. If you look at here, great grandfathers. If you look at here, mother's fathers, and they were all slaves. But this was a repro, it was abolished in 1801. But after that, you can see there's no, no longer slaves in this record. But this is old data. So here's we can, you know, the kind of, you know, the trace back to these old registers and find out what the fathers and grandfathers and great grandfathers, you know, the status were. So this is all the history of the no, no be uh, slave. Then as you can see, this is the wife after that. Wife and is all the family members, which under the, you know, this word means, you know, the having, you know, under, then it starts another second household. So he typed all this information into Excel file <laughs> with this actually, you know, you know, you know the uh, book, booklet. Then we use this, you know, digitalized data to do some, some statistical analysis. So this is why we can say that really it's a joint work between sociologists and historians. Probably we could do if we just do ourselves. Okay, so this is a basic material that we use for our study. Isn't that cool? Yes. So why why okay, so that's a very good question. And let me give one more slide before I answer the <laughs> question because here is a Jeju. So that's what, so the, our data came from two villages in Jeju Island. So Jeju Island is actually the you know, uh, biggest island in Korea, and this is the Korean Peninsula, and this is uh, China, so, and this is Japan, right, this side. So among these, you know, the big island, within big island, Hamori and Sageri, which is the two villages that we uh, got the Hojok Ho from, which located in this part of the island. So then the question is, why Jeju? Uh, because Hojok actually were found in many other places in Korean Peninsula, like Tansong, which is in the southern, you know, uh, southern east, 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 southern part of the Korean Peninsula, and Daegu has another big, you know, the household register, and some other area too. But Jeju, uh, from our, you know, his actually investigation, according to his investigation, Jeju has mostly probably well connected, you know, data. So some of, you know, the data missing for certain years. So we actually lost sometimes, you know, people, we cannot link people across the generation because some of the years are disappeared, you know, and we couldn't find this, you know, the, some of the data between years. So especially the Daegu Hojok is one of the, uh, the Hojok where there's lots of missing between years. So we can actually, it's very hard to find the family to be linked across many, many, you know, the uh, years of the household register. So that's one reasons, you know, kind of technical reasons why we, choose the Jeju. Another region is probably this is more close to uh, close to population, right? Because it is, you know, the island, it's very hard to move, to especially, you know, from the uh, from the island to the, you know, the peninsula. So, but if you live in other parts of the Korean peninsula, people could actually move. And if you move out, then we don't have your information anymore in that village, unless we have a same household the register of the village that you moved out. So in fact, we have much more detailed information and we can actually make a much stronger linkage across the generation using the Jeju uh, Island. So the question is whether then those are finding, it, can we generalize you know, our finding to other place? I, I don't think you know, the, we can say yes because of the difference you know, obviously in the location, difference in some of you know, the administrative you know, the importance as compared to other place. So, but I think so we not actually make a bold argument claim that, you know, yes, we can generalize to other place, but I think we want to see in this particular, you know, the place, then see to what extent it was mattered or did not matter. So that's, you know, the, the our proposed, but that's a very legitimate question, whether we can generalize this finding even to other parts of the Korea, or even to China, or, you know, at that moment. But that's, I think, the big question. Yes? Uh, 
oh, I see. You know what? I don't have that. I mean, I, we can count the household register and show you how the population change. I do have a little bit of data about the number of actually, you know, the men. So, but I don't actually have that information on my top of my head. So, but m maybe next time I come back to Michigan to give that, uh, uh, that numbers, okay? So our study, we select adult men record in the register from 1864 and 1894. Why do we select this man? Because their fathers were no, none of their father was Nobi, because Nobi was uh, uh, abolished in 1801, right? So by looking, at, uh, by looking at the adult men in these periods, we have the man whose fathers no longer, their fathers were Nobi at all. So they were all born after abolition of government owned the Nobi system in 1801. Interesting enough, in Jeju, we don't have many private actually owned the Nobis. All, most of actually Nobis in Jeju were actually government owned Nobi. So that's probably another reason. Yes, that, I think it's one of the reasons that why we want to use that. Because otherwise, you know, you have, you know, I think this is much better in our sense to look at this abolition of 1801 uh, for the government owned Nobi. And men whose father and their social status were identified. And we have 945 adult men. And because they can appear in every you know, the, uh, register in principle, one person can have more you know, multiple observation, right? So we have 4,500 about observation for uh, 945 adult men. 18th century, 19th century data for 900 men. I think this is a pretty, yeah, pretty impressive you know, the data record. Although, you know, compared to recent data for 10,000 population, I don't know, but this is, I think, I think a decent number. Then we further select the people, men, whose grandfathers and their social status were identified. Because some of them moved recently, then we don't have their you know, ancestral information. But then we may concern about how they are different from these people who stay longer in that village. But fortunately, no, and maybe this actually reflects another probably this less mobility in that, you know, the, in Jeju, we only lost a little bit, 100 people after, you know, to exclude people who don't have a grandfather's information. So now we have 821 adult men. Actually, I'm sorry, we have more. This is old data, so we actually, you know, the, yeah, I should update. But about the 4,000 observation. Okay, so we have 4,000 observations. So what we are looking at, we're looking at the possibility of attaining the high state positions among those 1860, uh, the adult men in 1864 and 1894. So again, remember, the, the, abolish, the Nobi system was abolished in 1801, so none of them are Nobi, none of their fathers were Nobi, right? And the, among the grandfathers, they could be little, you know, father, but mostly in great great fathers, we see the more, you know, the novice, obviously, before the abolition of novice system. And to look at this outcome, we predict this outcome with whether one's great grandfather was novice. In other words, in this paper, we define ancestor as a great grandfather. So the question is, what if your great grandfather was novice? What is your likelihood? of getting to the high status position after abolition of you know, the, uh, uh, the Nobis system. Then compared to the great-grandfather uh, great of the high status group and the great-grandfather of the middle status group. We control for father's status and grandfather's status, age and register years and village. Because you know, we want to take into account the difference between, between two villages, which was not that much different eventually, and years and other, you know, the outcomes, uh, other, you know, control variables. Again, let me kind of show some, you know, the diagram to show what we are really doing here. So if you remember, great-grandfathers, we had a five status group in Choson. And we combined them two into the high, middle two as a middle, and nobi as a low. But 1801, this time was abolished. So now we don't have any more nobi slaves, but we have four different groups. And we have now basically two groups, high and not high. But remember, compared to this period, we have a very high percent of the population in the high status. Because again, there was system was upgrade. And the you know, slave system was abolished. So then you can think about just more opportunity, right, for this even nobody descendants to move up to the high status position.
previous occupations that we want to look at. And okay, okay, don't, don't, don't. We run the logistic regression, predict this log odd of the attaining the high status position. So the PI is a probability of getting to the high status position. So this is a log odd and was predicted by whether your great grandfather was Nobi, right? And whether your great grandfather was actually like, belonged to the middle status as compared to great grandfather was of a high status. So if you think about logically, this beta one could be a negative or a positive. Should be negative or positive. Again, this is the, we are predicting the possibility of getting to the high state position, right? And this is indicate the difference between people whose grand grandfather was high state and people whose grand grandfather was, you know, the nobi. Negative, right? Because now probably nobi's descendants will much have a, a hard time to get to the high status position if everything is equal. Am I right? So you expect negative here and also probably less negative, but still probably negative than compared to the high status grandfather, great grandfather. Does that make sense? So you don't have to worry, uh, think about all the equation, but the point is that beta n and beta 2 will be negative if everything is equal, right? Because again, if everything is equal, then the chance for descendant of whose great grandfather was high status people was much higher chance to get it to the high status position, right? As compared to the nobi and middle status people. But in the second model, what if we control for father status and grandfather status? Let's say you and I the same for father's class and grandfather's class. Your father was high class, your grandfather was high class, my father did, my grandfather did. But I still, my great grandfather was nobi, but your great grandfather was high status. Then do we still have a difference in terms of chance to get to the high status position, right? So if we still do see the difference, that means that great grandfathers still matter for, even though you and I have exactly the same fathers and grandfathers status, right? But if is disappear, then we can say that great grandfathers do not matter anymore once we take into account fathers and grandfather status. So we want to compare actually how beta one and beta two change after taking into account father status and great grandfather status, even grandfather status. Does that make sense? So your idea now is that beta one will be reduced if control for these things, right? In other words, the difference between me and you and my great-grandfather was nobi and your great-grandfather was high status will be reduced, this difference, once we take into account father's and grandfather's status. Isn't that great? I'm <laughs> gave a, like a... Can I, can I ask yeah. a question? Yes, about right. He is telling us here, Nicholas, what's the average age of father when how oh, that's a good question. Do you know what's the average age of the huh? Do why why are you asking that question? I Must be. I think the when the, the, the Kota was collected in 1865. Right. So if you are say 30, and generation is 30 years, so your great grandfather will be nine years older than you. That means. At the time, your grandfather would be 100 years old, but by that he was plus 10. Right. So that means. But we know that when he was young, because we can even uh, trace to the earlier register. I know. Right. Uh, but uh, my thinking is because the Nobi Jedo was about the ancient world. Oh, right. Every great grandfather father was Nobi at the time of the. Death. Right, right, right. So there's a lot of contrast. So great great so great grandfathers. And great fathers, there's uh, some change. Obviously, it depends on, as you point out, depends on you know, when uh, my father was born and w when the father was uh, great. So you still see uh, some nobi, but also it's very reduced. Then if you look at the father's case, and there's no, no nobi any, any longer, then your generation also, we don't have any nobi. I, I think I need to have my head around. Right, right, okay. So we'll get there, sure, right. 
So this is a basically the whole table. The basic most important table, it shows that how likely to get to the highest positions given your ancestor position. So I say the 4,000 case uh, observation, right? So here's 4,000 observation. Again, but before getting to that, let me tell you one clear story. So as you can see by descendants, 75% of descendants are now first class. Because again, afraid of social status. So 75% of populations become the first class. In this situation, do we still see the effect of you know, the uh, Novi ancestors, right? So those are the kind of situation. So if you look at the people who came from great-grandfathers, almost everyone actually end up by themselves with the high status position, 94%, okay? If you start with the grand grandfather who are the middle class, middle social status, 70% of them end up with the highest positions among those, you know, the uh, adult men in 1864 to 1894. But for Novi ancestor, we have only 21%. After four generations later, you still see this effect. But this is, uh, you know, the gross effect. So once we this effect may be generated because their father was the first class, their great, uh, their grandfathers were the first class. So it may be not particularly because great grandfathers. So we need control for father status and grandfather status, but this is a, you know, gross difference, and you can see that even after four generations later, three generations later, you still see that you know, there's still great grandparents uh, matter. 21% versus 94%. And these people, we don't know their, uh, their great-grandfather's information because probably they moved recently compared to the other group. So instead of dropping them, we try to understand how they you know, look like too. So as you can see that these people whose great, uh, grandfathers, we know about grandfathers, but we don't know their great-grandfathers because again, they probably moved recently compared to other groups. And they work very similarly to the middle class, middle groups, okay? So this is a logistic regression, as I mentioned. So as you can expect that this is negative coefficients, right? So in other words, if you have actually a you know, great-grandfather who was a novi, you had much higher uh, difficulty to get to the high status position. But it is much less, uh, but if you have a middle, a middle class, middle status ancestor, it is still, negative and dot indicate stars indicate it is significant that means still you have less chance to get to the high status but as not as bad as this novi ancestor right but after controlling for father status and grandfather status what you can see is that the gap is declined right from minus point minus four to minus two as compared to who whose ancestor was a high status people. So it's a reduced, and this one was a reduced, but the point is that they are still less significant, uh, they are still less likely to move to the high status position. Right? Okay. Let me give you another, using this logistic regression, I give you the, some expected probab probability. In other words, what is my chance? to get to the high status position if my father was high status, my grandfather was high status, and my great-grandfather was high status. So using these coefficients, I can calculate the expected probability of getting to the high status position, and this is what it's about. So, if your father made high status, if your grandfather made high status, if your great-grandfather was high status, your chance is almost one. In other words, you are just, will be just fine. <laughs> yeah, basically. But your father's made a high status, your great uh, grandfather made a high status, but your great grandfather was no B, then you actually have a lower chance than these people, right? 83%. They have higher, relative high chance because their father actually made their grandfather made, but just simply because their grandfather was a great grandfather or nobi, they have 
much less chance than these people. But if you really look at these people whose father, whose grandfather did not make it, but if your great grandfathers make, then you still have almost half of them who will make the high states of position. Again, these people, their father was dumb, their, great, their grandfather was dumb, but because their great grandfather was the high state position, almost half of them actually have a chance to get to the high state of position. But these people, their father did not make, their grandfather didn't, uh, great, uh, grandfather did not make, and their great grandfather was Nobi. It's almost just forget about chance to get to the high state position, right? So, as if you compare this. Fathers matter more, right? Because if you compare with this group, they have a high status ancestor. You know, like you know, you, as you can see that these people have a higher chance than these people it means that you know the father matter more than grand, uh, grandfathers. But still, grandfather matter, but great grandfather also matter. So this is a story. So in other words. Our study showed that you know, the substantial legal, uh, legacy effect of Novi system, even after four genera the three generations, you still see the effect of you know, the great grandfathers. So descendants whose ancestors were Novi were much less likely to attain the high state position than descendants whose ancestors belonged to the high status position. Even among the commoners, the middle class also had lower chance to get to the high status position, right, as compared to the high state position. These change happens when there is a dramatic increase of the first class position. So in other words, this increase of first class position was filled first by this high class people first, then probably later after you know, middle class. So in other words, increased position at the first class does not necessarily mean the declining inequality. This increased opportunity can be filled first by this high status position who could probably first you know, fill that position rather than these nobis and other middle class position people. So although the relative disadvantage of nobis descendants was reduced by controlling for fathers and grandfathers status as we just saw because grandfathers matter and fathers also matter. So if you, you and I have the exactly same father and grandfathers, then great grandfathers will be much less matter than you and me, but still grand grandfathers matter for your, my chance to be, become the first class. So why then, right? The question is why? Even after 100 years, why do these Nobi ancestors still matter for these people? Do you actually remember your great-grandfathers? I don't, I even don't know, <laughs> to be honest. I even don't know my great-grandfather's name. Then how do, should that matter for me? It's not fair, right? I mean, why should the fact that my great-grandfather was Nobi still matter for me to get to the high state of chain? Even the situation where there's an increasing opportunity to get to the high status position, but not me. So this is the kind of question that we want to address in the next step. So uh, in other words, I think the important question is about the mechanism through which this ancestor become matter for this, you know, the descendant social mobility chain. And we think there's a two possible uh, mechanism possibility. Uh, possibly. One is about the social recognition and fame in the village. You know, so in other words, social discrimination. So in Korean, they say, which means you are the son of the nobi. So this is a very strong stigma attached to the nobi descendant. And maybe it was actually carried over to some extent, even though the system was abolished. So when they have such a discrimination, although this is a not legal discrimination anymore because the system was abolished, but this social discrimination probably, uh, you know, to constrain these descendants of Nobi to accumulate their wealth and to get additional information about uh, how they actually, you know, to, to succeed in their economies and other things. So. You know, probably this descendant Nobi, and probably to some is less extent, but to some extent, this middle class descendant have a hard time to accumulate wealth at the very beginning. So when you start with the large money, then you can easily to make money grow, right? I mean, yes, if you have a endowment, the endowment grows, right? I mean, but if you don't have money, that's very hard to start with. 
and you may not actually easily accumulate your wealth over the across the generation. So in sociology, we call the cumulative advantage. So the people may who start at very high, they may have m much more chance to actually trans confer their advantage to the next generation as compared to people who start actually from the bottom. But there's another probably mechanism we in sociology we call the opportunity holding. It is to exclude noble descendant from access to resource and information by high state of descendant. In other words, they don't allow them noble descendant to come to our network. So we share information, we share our economic resource. Do you need something? I can give you. But if you're a Nobi descendant, we are done. So I think, you know, again, I think because of data, we can actually address whether this really worked in that village. But I think it is social recognition and fame in the village and social discrimination. That could be probably, you know, the one of the important, actually, it could be one of the important mechanisms. So we don't know yet how we actually show that that was the region, really. But, you know, uh, maybe we can actually look at some of the outcome for their wealth. So we don't, even though we don't have information about their wealth on this early time period, but actually Kunta has information about the, uh, the land size among those very recent you know, descendants in the early to, uh, 20th century. So there, some of their you know, the descendants stay there for long, and we do have their actually land size information. So if we find Nobia ancestral descendants have much smaller size of land compared to this high status descendant, we may find some of the evidence for this cumulative advantage, even though we don't know much, we don't know actually how much this ancestor had originally from the land, but we do know that was their outcome among the descendants. So we try to see whether that's happening in this village, so that's kind of our next step. Okay, so I think we can stop here, and I'm in the more than welcome to your question. Thank you. Yes. Nobi was actually inherited. Nobi was inherited, right. But the Yangins were not inherited, which is commoners. If, um, people in high status, so if their children are in the Yangin village, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right, no, I think that's a good question. But I think you know, the, among those, you know, the high states father, if we have actually two sons, they sometimes become the two different, you know, the status. Like one person get the high status, but the people can the second status. Depends on how they were successful in their lifetime course. So in other words, that's why we're saying that it is not naturally just inherited. In other words, if you have a father who is a first class, it's nat it, it doesn't automatically assign the high status to you. So again, I think you know it's very hard for them to move down to the fourth status group because, but that's also true for here in contemporary society. In other words, even though by law there's you know the possibility to move down and move up, but socially there's much more chance to them to keep because probably they either had a much higher chance to succeed in the ta you know passing the exams, or they may show some of you know, or they have some their same maybe inherited some wealth, which we don't know much about the information about the wealth inheritance per se, but that makes you to the, be, uh, become the first, you know, the class. So I think there is a possibility of moving around, but obviously long distance movement was much difficult, I guess, you know, from the table I show, I mean, that's kind of, you know, to prove that, the, you know, the possibility. So there are possibility to move around because the law doesn't pro, you know, prohibit this social movement, uh, the upward and downward movement. But by social you know, conventions or social force, the probably long term, long distance movement was more difficult than. Uh, oh, the, uh, the right, right. 
uh, very rare in Jeju, uh, Jeju uh, household register. But if you look at the other part of the, you know Hojok in other part of Korean Peninsula, you see many actually you know the private own. Uh, on on Nobis, and if we actually can link them across a generation, it'll be very interesting to compare even government owned Nobis and private owned Nobi. So our hypothesis is that also you know based on our understanding of the life conditions of government owned Nobi, probably they had a much better chance than private owned Nobi. But that's our just hypothesis, and we don't know much about it yet. Can I answer that question first? So it's not like, you know, the, okay, from next year, please register me as a young, you know, the young, the first class. No, it's not like that. I mean, it is very serious records. I mean, it is taxation records. So, you know, at the village level, why don't you, you know, register me from, you know, the third category from now on, you know, even though I'm forced. It's not like that. There's a very strong, again, if I can show you and if I can demonstrate that what the mechanism of you know assigning people to which category, that could be very easy to answer all these questions. But in old days, we don't know much about that mechanism. In other words, how much do I have to make money to become the first class? How much like you know the contribution I have to make the village to be considered as a second category of the citizen? So we don't know much about that mechanism. But all what we know is actually about which category they belong to. So but. I mean, your point is about whether they just simply, you know, registered, you know, that's a high status. I don't think that was the case, you know, because it was very serious, you know, the recording process at the village level so that, you know, there was a very strong social recognition. So, in other words, it's not like, you know, the next year you are the first, next year you are the second. You, no, it was actually not like that. Very, you know, the, sometimes very constant over the age, you know, years, but people, you know, sometimes, you know, even though sometimes moved up. But, so I think it, it's not like, in other words, it's not just simply recording regions to become the large at the first, you know, the first class. But I think there was some more other social probably change, you know, from some economic development during that time period. I don't know much about, you know, how much, but people now have more, actually more people actually accumulate wealth so that they can demonstrate that, you know, that I be, you know now they are considered as a first class. So I think there's a probably some other social change, which you made a good point about what are those, you know, the social change which I don't know much about yet, but I think it was more like it reflected some of this, you know, the change in social status system rather than a recording, you know, the increase of the record per se. Yeah, no, it is, it's not that simply, okay, please, you know, the register me as, you know, the first class. No, it's not like that because this is a very serious, I mean, government, if you do not, if I do not record you as, uh, you know, the third class, I lose taxation from you. So I need, give it, you know, the, actually, you know, the money from you, then I have to be very careful about, you know, the how to record. So I don't think, we don't think of this is just, you know, the, you know, the, like a bribe, bribing to, you know, the, the people that, okay, from next year, please, you know, register me as, you know, the young bot. Okay.
Thank you. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is relative to something that I'm raising. Mm -hmm. So I think there's now some religion in which you allow touching of other human beings. Mm -hmm. In your country. And okay. And um, racial politics that you see in your country. Nationalizing oh. um, some subjects. And then the Uh, and that sort of status kind of thing. I don't know if I don't know what you think about that. If right, you right. Spiritual foundation. Wow. So I think that's a pretty. Uh, I don't know. Even we have information about like that kind of ethnicity information in culture. Probably not. Yeah. I don't. Yeah. I think we don't have information about that. And in other words. What was the original, you know, the ethnicity of them, you know, but but do you know how actually, f w like, what the size of populations? I mean, do do we know about how large that kind of population were in that time period? Okay, I see. Okay. Right. Okay. Right. Sure what historians right. Have, uh, I see. Right. Wow. No, I don't think you know we know much much about it and our culture don't or doesn't have that kind of you know the detailed information. But certainly we can think about. But you know, it's just not much I can say. Yeah, at this point. Yes. Right, right. So we talk about uh, oh. Okay. So is that okay? In, f in fact, you know, to not Jeju mm -hmm. House of Register because we uh, we need to publish paper before we <laughs> release the data. But actually, Tan Song Ho Jok is all digitalized and published. Mm -hmm. So you just need the time probably to link people across because the, the data that will release does not link data. So you have to link data across you know, generation, right? So in other words, we know the fathers of the respondent because you know we have name, but if you go to the next register, then we have a link with them, another register, we have to link with them. And so we have to make a very long process. It takes more than years, I mean, so, so are you saying that we are going to release this whole link data? Or are you going to ask to? Yeah, that was my question. Uh, I mean, I think even Jeju Hojo was actually now is in book, right? So if you want to actually look at that books, that's are there. So this is not like our proper. I mean, this is open source, so there's no one can. Oh, it's the 19th century. Yeah, mostly yeah, 19th century because the 18th century Hojo was not like you know the release, yeah. and we. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a very sensitive I issue. So, but. But even. So eventually, we may actually, yeah, right. I mean, right, in a few years later, depends on his. <laughs> so what is, what is going, what is going to say is that you know the the village where people know about this register because this is a very sensitive record, right? I mean, think about if you know that your ancestor was Nobu, who. Who's be happy with that, right? I mean, so this could be very, I don't know, I'd be happy because <laughs> it shows the, yeah, it shows the social mobility, right, exactly, right? But someone may not be comfortable with the fact that, you know, they were the, you know, the Nobu ancestors. So, in fact, a lot of people in certain buildings actually destroy this information. So that's why, you know, it becomes sensitive. So, you know, the, you know, we could actually luckily to get that, you know, the, I mean, it was, he doesn't have actually original book, but he just took a picture all in the page, and then we, you know, just he trans, you know, the type all the information into Excel file. So that's how I think we gather information. So, so is there 
Depending on who has a question, we may not have a time where we have a time for one question. Okay, then go to our final question. Right, right. So the fact that they were records in the House of Register means they're economic power? Is that what the question? I mean, um, what I'm saying is, if you are taxed, let's say the Department of Justice is taxing you for your work, mm -hmm. and Oh, I think you know the uh, Joseph at least you know according to him because I asked the same question. Mm -hmm. But it looks like in Joseph period they didn't have this professional taxation. In other words, it's not like a here to now in the United States and in a lot of many countries that you know we have higher percentage rate for the top income category, right? Like a twenty close to like a thirty five percent, forty percent, and you know low percent or vice versa. No, I think it was not based on this kind of proportion. And remember, these are the high stakes people were not actually subject to this military service. So they were subject to the land taxation. So if they had the land, then have to pay. But this was actually more like a military service. Uh, so in Joseon period, there was a different type of you know sort of taxation. And military military service was one of the taxation. So in other words, as the citizens, you have to actually serve to keep the country basically, but these high people were exempt from military service because they were you know the prepared for the civil service exam and other things. But they you know they most of, many of them uh, for those who had the land, right? They have to pay for the, this land. Then later they now instead of this new directly military service, they actually pay in money then or some other way because you know the country doesn't need actually you know, many military so it's still service. But then they ask more like the things to come as money and other you know so like the materials rather than the military service. So I think you probably want to talk to him after this presentation about how exactly so taxation was made in this kind of Joseph period. But I think that's a very important point because taxation may actually matter for someone who actually the person for the person who actually accumulate the wealth, right? So I think the taxation probably in as an institution I think that's probably very important thing to look at. Okay, great. With that, please join me thanking. Thank you.